Hello everyone, welcome to this week's EKG. Our case today is a very interesting one. We have a 84 year old male, you're dispatched to a cardiac arrest. His wife found him unconscious and unresponsive in the living room after he had just had breakfast. Um, she says that he has had a pretty significant heart history, had a coronary artery bypass done several years ago. He's on a medication called Sotalol, which catches my attention because it's notorious for prolonging the QT. Um, and uh, so you get there, you start doing CPR, it gets a round of epi and you get ROSC within eight minutes. This was a great job um, by one of our engine crews here. The first set of vitals after they get ROSC is a heart rate of 84 with a blood pressure of 95 over 53 and an end tidal of 50. So this is fantastic. We've got a good set of vitals here. We've got a good direction to go. And we know that every time after we get ROSC, we really wanna take our time, slow down. These patients are very fragile. So get everything you can in order to keep those pads on, get a good blood pressure. Think about starting a presser because usually that blood pressure will dwindle down. Um, in this case, they, they had an epi drip ready. I would always, if you can, and have the ability leave a fed tends to be a little bit better in cardiogenic shock but epi is what we had epi is what we did and it worked good for this guy um, and then you get a 12 lead to see if maybe the cause of this cardiac arrest was cardiac in origin and so this is the 12 lead that they get i'll take you i'll give you just a minute to take a look at this see what you think And here we can go through it together, just like we do every time. So we'll start with rate. Our rate is 84, according to the computer. I'm gonna take a look and just make sure I agree with that computer. I find a QRS vector that matches up with a big pink thick line. I'm gonna use this one right here, and then we count down. So 300, 150, 100, 75, somewhere between 75 and 100. I'd agree with the computer, it's 84. Next question is, is it regular or irregular? You can use your, just a quick glance at this. It looks like everything marches out very regularly. I would call this a regular rhythm. Next question, is there a P wave before a VQRS? And this is where this one gets very interesting. Um, I see a bunch of P waves here in lead two. That almost looks like a fib, right? Which is weird because usually a fib is irregular. What I else I see here is these spikes before every QRS, and you can see them a little bit better. And the life packs are really nice because they have these arrows. That just in case I was to miss that little subtle spike, this arrow is telling me that there's some pacer spikes there. So I do see a pacer spike before every QRS, and I see a bunch of P waves before every QRS. So I'd call this a regular rhythm with ventricular pacing um, and probably an underlying AFib, which my suspicion would be this is probably why this patient has a pacer is because he's got um, some pretty bad atrial fibrillation going on. Next, we look at our axis, just like we always do. We look at lead one and lead AVF. Question is, which direction is the majority of the QRS vector? This one is kind of small here, but it's still mostly going up. We've got our left thumb up. AVF is mostly down. Um, so here I am with a left thumb up, a right thumb down for AVF. This is left axis deviation, uh, which would make sense in the setting of this um, wide QRS. And then our intervals. So we're looking at our QRS and our QTC. Our QRS is wide, it's greater than 120. And this makes sense as well because we're ventricular paced. Anytime the origin of the electrical conduction comes below the AV node, you can anticipate that you're gonna have a wide QRS. And so we see that here. It's not super wide, not super scary. It's more consistent with like a bundle branch block, but it is wide and then pretty typically when you have a wide QRS, everything gets lengthened out. And so it's not abnormal to have a long QT as well. So this QT is greater than 450, not greater than 500. I would anticipate that and that's okay, but it, it is worth noting, especially since this patient was on Sotalol, um, which can predispose patients to long QT. Lastly, we move on to our ST segments. I will be honest, it is very difficult to interpret and there's not really great literature out there on what to do with ST segments in the setting of a ventricular pacer. 
probably the best science out there says to treat it like you would a bundle branch block and you can use your Scarboso criteria to look for either greater than five millimeters of ST elevation in your septal and anterior leads or concordant changes. And if you remember concordance versus discordance, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, I'll have a better example for you. But here, let's go territorial just like we do every time. So we'll look at two, three AVF for our inferior leads first. Um, there's no T wave inversions. I don't see any ST elevations here. Inferior leads look good. We will then move to our high lateral leads, one and AVL. Again, I don't see any ST elevations, T wave inversions. T waves are inverted in AVL, which isn't totally normal, but we've already looked at our inferior leads, don't see any ischemic changes there, so I think we're good. Moving to our septal leads, I do see ST elevation here, uh, mostly just in V3. There's no reciprocal changes that we noted, and this is not greater than five boxes, and so this could be anticipated um, in this kind of rhythm. And again, moving four, five, and six, I don't see any concordant changes or any ST elevations or T wave inversions that would be concerning for ischemia. So I'll call these normal, but it's very difficult to interpret much else when you have a ventricular pacer. So when we think about a pacer, it's literally a box that's placed in the chest, and sometimes you can see it bulging out from under people's skin. It's got wires that go through a vein into the heart, and they can go to any place that the heart needs. It can go to, sometimes it'll go to the atrium, take over for the sinoatrial node, or sometimes it goes straight to the ventricles, either on the right or the left side. And you can tell on your 12 lead exactly what's being paced based on their rhythm. So our patient has a ventricular pacemaker, and if the majority of that electrical signal from the pacemaker is coming to the right side of the heart, you're gonna get a big depolarization from the right, which is gonna look like a left bundle branch block. If you remember the bundles, if you're getting a big depolarization to the right here, it's gonna look on your 12 liters if you're having a left bundle branch block. Opposite is true. If you're pacing the left and the big vector is going towards the left side, it's gonna look as if the right is maybe slower or not working correctly. So it may look like a right bundle branch block. So you can tell which ventricle is being paced based on the QRS morphology in V1. And then I mentioned discordant ST segments earlier. This is how you can, um, can tell in a, in a ventricular paced rhythm whether or not there's any ischemic changes. The major portion of the QRS complex should be opposite of the baseline from the ST segment, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But basically, you should have part of it going up, part of it going down. If both of the parts are going down or both of the parts are going up, that's probably a suggestion of ischemia. So when you're evaluating your patients with a pacemaker, what you want to see, first you want to see if there's pacer spikes. Does that explain what's going on? And your next question is, is the pacer working correctly? You know if they have a pacer, there's probably something wrong with their heart, and so they probably need this for a reason. You want to make sure it's working right. And so your first question is, after the pacer spike, is there a QRS after each complex? Is the pacemaker capturing those ventricles and making them do their job? In our case, the answer is yes. There was a pacer spike, and a QRS, heartbeats, that's good. The next question is maybe there's spikes where there shouldn't be. And that's a problem with sensing. The pacer should be able to sense the native activity of the heart, take over and make it do what it wants. And sometimes if the pacemaker is not sensing what the heart is doing, it's not able to do its job and help it beat. And then the total failure of a pacemaker would be indicated by either a long period of asystole or a sinus pause where the pacemaker isn't making any spikes, it isn't able to control the beat of the heart. And then that would be a complete failure. And then lastly, when you're evaluating a patient with a pacemaker, your question is, is there any ischemia? Which we already mentioned is kind of hard to tell, but there are subtle clues that you can look for. And so your best clue is gonna be those concordant changes. It's good, just like in the setting of a left bundle, you want discordant changes. And so the example of that would be, let's look at these septal leads here. Part of the QRS is up, T waves are down. QRS is up, T waves are down. 
this one is opposite. It's still discordant, but the QRS is down, T waves are up. So those are called discordant changes. Those are good. If both of those were, were up usually or concordant going the same direction, that would indicate ischemia. So what we have on this 12 lead, we have a ventricular paced rhythm with a rate of 84 and no ischemic changes. And we know that it's capturing because there is a QRS after every single pacer spike. And that is it for ventricular paced rhythms. I hope it was helpful and we'll see you next week.